hello and welcome to Talk Leadership with Cedric. You know, everybody needs a little TLC. Talk Leadership with Cedric is where we focus on leadership and personal growth with business leaders, educators, and local thought leaders. Our goal is to introduce our audience to leaders who are making an impact with innovative ideas. You know, our guiding leadership principle is the law of contribution, which says grow in yourself enables you to grow others. So you can't give what you don't have. So first you must grow yourself in order to grow others. So we believe that outstanding leaders like yourself will help us to help others. So tonight we have another dynamic leader with us tonight, folks. And I'm so excited to introduce our guest tonight. Um, we um, both are retired from Abbott and uh, I worked on, on one of his teams and I'm gonna introduce you to him. And let me tell you what, folks, we'll sit back a little bit and relax. Let me go through his impressive um, uh, bio for you real quick. But our guest tonight is Mr. Joe Nimmers. Now, Joe is an executive with over four decades of experience in, in the medical and pharmaceutical industries. He um, presently serves on the board of directors of DNA Diagnostic Center in Cincinnati, a leading DNA testing company. He is also an advisor to Parole Medical, a medical device startup um, company in, in, on the East Coast. Uh, from 2010 to 2017, Joe worked with global private equity firm called Warburg uh, Pincus as an executive in residence and a senior advisor for several successful in, um, investments. Now, in 2007, Joe retired from Abbott Laboratories in, after 27 years of service. Now that's a long time, folks. Think about that. 27 years with one organization. He worked um, in Abbott's Hospital, Pharmaceutical, um, in uh, International, and Diagnostic Divisions. He was also an executive director of the nonprofit Claire Abbott Foundation. Now, the Claire Abbott Foundation, folks, does some wonderful work for the community. But Joe led the integration of one of Abbott's um, uh, largest at the time um, uh, uh, merger, uh, um, mergers, if you, if you will, $7 billion acquisition of Knoll Pharmaceuticals, now known as Humira. And he was elected as the corporate officer in 2001. In 2003, he was named the president of Abbott Diagnostics and a senior vice president for diagnostics operations where he managed the turnaround of the laboratory and diagnostic, uh, laboratory diagnostic franchise. In 2006, he was appointed executive vice president. See folks, when we bring people here, we're bringing in some heavy hitters here. Tonight we have one of those. Executive vice president responsible for five uh, Abbott medical product businesses with a value of $3.5 billion in sales and over 13,000 employees. And he was a member of Abbott's executive leadership team. Now, Joe is a graduate of Arizona State University where he has a bachelor's degree in history. And he, um, and he also gained a commission um, in the United States Army through the ROTC program. He's presently pursuing his master's degree in history from Arizona State University. Now, I want to stop right there, folks. I want to say this. See, folks, once you reach a, a certain level, it doesn't mean you stop growing. It means that you just continue growing and you expand yourself. So he's pursuing his master's degree from Arizona, Arizona State University. He is an author of four books about his family and is presently writing a book on leadership. Now we have to get that book, folks. When it comes out, we're gonna make sure we mention that, right? Joe um, served as an Army officer um, in the Army from 1979 to 1993. As an Army officer, he was among uh, his uh, among his many commands and, and staff positions, he was an armored cavalry instructor. He has been an active, a very active community volunteer for over four decades and has held many board leadership positions in human uh, services and social services and in parochial education. He is the founder of Christ the King Jesuit College Prep. Let me say that again, folks. Let me make sure you understand this. He is the founder of Christ the King Jesuit College Prep, 
on Chicago's west side. It's the tough side of town, folks. St. John, um, uh, St. Paul, hold on a second, St. John Paul II High School in Arizona. And he is the immediate past chair of Common Catholic High School in Illinois. And presently, he is mentoring Franciscan friars of Holy um, Spirit. Now, folks, let me say this. You see, when you are an executive leader, when you are um, trying to also add value to other people, you do great things. And I want you tonight to listen in to this man as he talk about, um, he's not going to brag about it, but he's going to talk about some of the things that he's doing. And it's important for you to understand this. That's why I'm stopping here. It's important for you to understand it's not about your life. It's about what you give back to communities that you serve. He is the path um, trustee of the college at St. Benedict in Minnesota. And finally, and finally, but it's the, the greatest part of his life, he is married uh, to his wife, Kathy Rankin Nimmer, who is also a proud, avid retiree, and they live in Scottsdale, Arizona. Together, they have nine children and five grandchildren. So, folks, help me welcome Mr. Joseph Nimmers, Jr. to the show. Hi, Thank Cedric. You. Thanks for that buildup. I don't want to disappoint your audience. <laughs> Um, no, it's important uh, that that people understand uh, what things uh, Americans are doing in the world today. It's important for people to understand the things that people do to give back to their community, right? They hear about titles, but then they don't get to see the other side of it. So that's why it's important for me to read the bio so people can see other things that the people are doing. Well, again, thank you for taking the time to come on the show tonight. Uh, we're just going to dive right in. Um, so, you know, I've kind of read your, well, not kind of, I did read your bio, but tell the listeners about your journey to leadership and, and how did you get to where you are today? Well, first off, Cedric, I want you to know I have your Cedric LeFleur coin with me, which I keep <laughs> on my desk at all times, and it's here with me tonight. That's awesome. Um, it's a long journey, Cedric, that goes back about 50 years. Um, as far as journey to leadership, for me, it started in high school was sort of developed in the army and then it kind of got honed in the work I've done at Abbott and since then. Um, in high school, uh, my freshman year, I was kind of a quiet kid and I was looking for something different to kind of raise my profile and get some experience. And I joined student government. I did that for three years. We had a very active student government and uh, ended up as the president of my senior class. Um, I won't tell you the stories now, but I did learn how lonely leadership can be when you're 18 years old. Like I said, we won't talk about those. Um, the military was critical, as we'll talk in a minute, to developing sort of the foundation of, of my leadership skills. And of course, Abbott gave me lots of opportunity uh, over 27 years. So it, it sort of progressed from student <laughs> all the way through my corporate life. And now I'm back as a student again. That is amazing. Um, so, you know, what made you decide to, hey, I need to go back and get this master's degree? <clears throat> well, it's something I always wanted to do. Um, I thought one time about being a teacher and that didn't get very far um, <laughs> because I went in the army, then I went to work uh, at Abbott. But um, always something I wanted to do. History has been a passion of mine for a long time. And uh, ASU offers a very special program. The concentration is only about World War II, which is always the one thing I wanted to study. So it kind of all fell into place. And uh, next month I'm, I'm back in class again. Wow, that is amazing. And for the young people in the audience, this is important for you to really see and understand that growth never stops, no matter where you are in your journey. Growth never stops. So you had a long executive level corporate career. Help our audience understand the role that the military played. I know you were in the military, you know, at a younger age, but what role did the military play in shaping your leadership style? Well, it played most of the role, um, you know, in, in, the, in the Army in particular, you know this from the Air Force, uh, leadership is presented at all times. We're asked to study it, we're asked to read about it, we're asked to observe great leaders, and we're obviously asked to practice it much more than you see in the corporate world. So for me, it was the foundation of, of everything I ever learned about leadership. Um, one of the things that's always been difficult, and, and you may have experienced this too, when you, when you present military experience to a civilian audience, a lot of our country haven't served. And so they don't necessarily understand the translation of how that works in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And for me, you mentioned I was an armor officer, I was a tanker, and I used to train young men to be cavalry scouts. 
you know, I don't tell people that because it's about as far away from what they do in the real world as you could possibly imagine. But all the things that are necessary um, to get them to do that are the very basics of, of leadership skills. And I always like to tell the story. I was taught very, as a very young officer, the very fundamentals of servant leadership, uh, which was, you know, we didn't eat until our soldiers ate. And if there was no food left, we went hungry. Uh, we didn't sleep until our soldiers slept. We didn't take cover from the and from the weather until they did. So they always came first. And it's a wonderful way to sort of develop the basis of thinking about leadership, particularly if you end up responsibility for big organizations. So the Army certainly played a big part. Um, and a lot of it was professional development. Um, it's always, what I find in, in a long time at Abbott and since then was you have to almost go looking or volunteer for leadership courses in the corporate world in the military is presented to you on a daily basis. And so it was, it was so easy for me to do. Yeah. And, and it's presented to you in the, uh, on a daily basis. And when I, when I was in the air force, it wasn't, uh, well, Hey, do you want to go to this course? Uh, you've already been enrolled in this course. And <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but, um, that, that definitely helps grows your, your leadership, um, ability and, and, and path. So, you know, the audience is always uh, interested in the path of an executive leader. Um, and, and you've had a lot of different jobs, a lot of different roles. Uh, so help us walk us through some of the different jobs you took along your career path. And the reason I'm asking this, Joe, is because we have some, some people that are in sales that are trying to understand how to navigate different, different career paths. So help us with that. Well, I had, uh, and this is not an unusual experience, <laughs> my wife had a similar experience. I had 18 jobs in 27 years, which translates to about a job every year and a half. And in the end of my career, I had a job about every year, which I can go through later. Um, I took a, a non-conventional route to executive leadership or general management. Uh, I was in supply chain and manufacturing for 20 years. And that's typically not a way into the suite. Uh, it usually comes from commercial people, sales, marketing, and, and business development. Um, you can get to a high level in, in manufacturing and supply chain, but you typically don't end up in the suite. Um, and this sort of leads into a different discussion, which is the only lateral I ever took in 27 years was the one that totally changed my career and put it on a very accelerated uh, trajectory. So I had been, um, uh, like I said, in, in, in manufacturing for 20 years, and I felt I could do more. And I had a good relationship with, because I provided products and materials for a lot of the other added businesses. And so I knew all the presidents of those divisions. And I went around to all of them and I said, I want to do something different. I don't know what it is. Um, there were about seven people at the time and, and all of them kind of patted me on the head and said, you know, you're, you're a really good manufacturing guy. You might want to wait for your boss to die or something and you'll be that job someday. And uh, I went to one guy, uh, one division president who didn't believe in any of that. And he said, you know, he looked at me and he said, what's your passion? And I said, I love organizing things and getting things done. And he said, you can do that anywhere. And the next day I got an offer to transition into commercial operations as the head of marketing and sales services. So I went from 20 years of manufacturing to um, kind of a similar job. I was responsible for all of the stuff that it takes to keep the pharmaceutical sales force in the field. So that was cars and quotas and incentives, market research, advertising, anything you can think of. Uh, that wasn't a direct part of the franchise. And it was a wonderful introduction for me. And then, you know, five years later, I was an executive officer. Um, I, I had a very, I had a Colin Powell-like trajectory uh, by being in the right place at the right time and by being able to organize things, I think. But So I took a very different career to get to where I was. And I had to, you know, I had to learn pretty quickly at the end of my career because I had never had exposure to general management or some of the things we had to do. So it was a bit of drinking from a fire hose for a while. Yeah. Well, you bring up a great point, though. You said, hey, some of it was timing. <clears throat> yeah, you said it, right? So with timing, sometimes um, uh, we have to be careful what we ask for. People will, hey, I, I want a new job. I want to get promoted. But then they get offered something and then hesitate on it. So uh, right. talk about that a little bit. How important is it to, if you're ready, if you say you want this, to, to move into it? If you want to take a lateral, is that what you mean, or just a different assignment? Uh, just a different assignment. Well, you know, a lot of this is going to come back to when we talk about mentorship, we're going to talk about advocacy, and we'll talk about networking. But I think one of the things that, uh, particularly if you work in a big company, it, it's sometimes hard to figure out where you want to go because it's kind of a smorgasbord of opportunity. 
on one hand. On the other hand, you might have people telling you you're just an accountant, you know, or you're just an R&D guy or you're just a supply chain guy. And so you really have to get out, look around, look at the people you work with, see if there's something that interests you uh, and try to go from there. Um, I think one of the things that's important is not to stay in the same channel the entire time. Now, if you're a finance person, you love finance, stay in that discipline as long as you want. But our company, and one of the great things about Abbott was if you wanted to do something different, people would largely give you the opportunity. And uh, that was a wonderful way to grow up. All companies aren't that way. But uh, it starts with researching, looking around, looking at who you're working with and seeing if that's something that you want to do. Uh, and sometimes you do have to take that lateral job. We all want to be promoted everywhere along the way. But sometimes the lateral one, like with me, could make a big difference. Yeah, and um, so talking about, talking about laterals, um, uh, it, you know, you hear all the time that sometimes you may have to take a lateral, and a lot of people are reluctant to take lateral, right? Um, so, from an executive level, how do you talk talk with someone about taking that, a lateral position, and, and and then what things you think that could help them with moving forward? Well, part of it depends upon what their needs are. You know, sometimes you have to take a ladder to get exposure to something that may be useful to you two or three moves down the way, uh, particularly if you're identified as someone who has potential. Um, so each of those conversations were different. It just depended upon the, the person uh, and the opportunity and what they wanted to do. Sometimes, the, you know, the, the, the business didn't necessarily want somebody to do something, but they wanted, like me, I wanted to go out and try something different. And you have to respond to that in, in some way. You have to say no, or if you want to try that, you're not going to get promoted. You'll have to take a lateral, be there a couple of years, and there's no guarantee you can come back. You have to take that risk if that's what you're going to do. Sure. Yeah. Well, that, that's awesome. Well, Joe, you know, you took that that leap and, and moved over to um, diagnostic uh, side of our, our business. And um, you did that uh, where the time where we were going through several different things. There were a lot of different events uh, going on, and you were one of the leaders that led the organization through um, maybe not crisis, several different events. Um, and uh, one of those was, you know, the the, the uh, FDA consent decree. One of those was the null um, acquisition. Another one was um, Hurricane Katrina. Right. Um, so, you, you know, you had some, uh, I'm surprised you're not like this right now. <laughs> no, but I'm going I'm to go into PTSD here in a minute if you keep saying all these things all the time. I've forgotten about most of them, Cedric. I'll talk to him about it for you, but <laughs> some of those are a little difficult. Yeah, so with those experiences, help us understand from your perspective, what was that experience like? Um, you know, we know you have to be calm and cool for, for the, the, the troops and the, 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 the people, but what was that like for you in that moment? Which one do you want to talk about? <laughs> 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 they were all life altering. Yeah, they, they definitely were for you too. Uh, yeah, they were definitely um, uh, ma major events. Well, so I'll start with the, the, the FDA consent decree. What was that like? Well, just for your audience, if, if, if they weren't around, a consent decree, in, in kind of a simple way of looking at it, is a way for the government to force a regulated business to do something. In our case, we were regulated by many businesses, by many entities, including the FDA. And I'm not going to get into all the details, but sure. Abbott Diagnostics um, did some things or didn't do some things, and the government thought we should, and so they, we entered into a consent decree. And it's a pretty serious business. It's about as serious as it gets. And so we had products removed from the market to get our attention. Uh, in the end, what they wanted was for us to, to uh, do the things with, uh, with compliance in our manufacturing operations, among other things, that they wanted to see done, that they had felt were lagging. And so we had products removed from the market. We couldn't introduce new products for a period of time. Uh, it was a very difficult uh, period for actually for a long period of time until we came out of it um, because our sales were affected. We lost market share. We were the world leader going into this. Um, our margin obviously fell. We had to lay off people. It was it was a pretty tough time. Um, and so and there were really two things that, that we talk about with that. You just touched on, on both of them. One was it was a crisis for a period of time. And the other was cultural change was required. Change was required because part of the reason that we got into this problem was the culture at the time led it in that direction. And there were, I'm not going to get into the details, but there were really two things that had to get fixed. One was the FDA compliance. And the other was sort of the culture as it related to the customer, <clears throat> because we had gotten away from the customer as being a great big uh, diagnostic company. 
and uh, and we lost a lot of share and, and we had a lot of very unhappy customers for a period of time. And so it required to be calm, but it, it really was it was equal parts crisis management and equal parts culture change. And sure. the, the, cult, the crisis part um, was in the beginning when we were issued the consent decree and then when the business failed the first inspection. And then as we got ready for the second one, which we did pass eventually. But the culture change was a big part. It was getting people to think differently about quality, differently about compliance, differently about the customer. And so it was equally weighted. And, and oftentimes crisis management and culture change can be the same thing and, uh, and can take the same skill sets. So sure. um, that particular one, you know, is one that I, I have gray blanked out in my head from <laughs> five years of dealing with that. But in the end, we won. And, and you know, it's, it's fun for me to look back today and say Abbott Diagnostics is, I think, the biggest business that Abbott is probably the most profitable. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's well, the one that's in the news today. It's in the Rose Garden with, you know, instruments all the time. I'm so proud of, of how that business turned out. But uh, absolutely. it was a challenge for a while. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the other uh, uh, events that you managed through was the Knoll uh, acquisition, yeah. um, which was, you know, it's always a happy days for Avid when, when you're going through, or for any business when you're going through acquisition uh, type thing. So walk us through that. What was it like from your level to manage through that part or lead the company through that? Well, I'll tell you that, but I'm going to link it to the first question you asked me. So uh, I went over, I took the only lateral I ever had. I spent a year in marketing and sales services. It was wonderful. I learned how all you commercial people talk. So I had the ability to how to speak the language. I was there a year and I got a call from Miles White, our CEO, and he said, I want you to run Claire Abbott, um, which was the, the private foundation uh, that helps Abbott employees and retirees. It was, it, it needed some help. So I did that for a year. And then at the end of that year, he called and said, we just, you saw in the papers, we just bought Canole from BSF. And it was $7 billion. It was at its biggest acquisition. And I want you to run the integration. And it was an interesting challenge because these were two um, historic companies in the pharma space. Abbott going back to Dr. Abbott in 1885, Canole going back to the Canole brothers in Germany in about the same time period. And really responsible for sort of the modern way of looking at pharmaceutical R&D and manufacturing, two great companies. A uh, very German company and a very American company. And it was it was an interesting challenge culturally to put them together. That lasted about a year. Um, it went great. It was a wonderful learning experience. Um, the thing that I think was the most important that came out of that, we inherited about 10,000 terrific um, people from, from Canole that have since integrated and become great avid citizens. Um, the other was, early on, uh, I was told, uh, as, as we started this, there was an R&D project that I had to absolutely protect as part of the integration. And we had to literally, we called it ring fencing. We wouldn't let anybody, Canole or Abbott, near them. And it was, a, the code was D2E7. Well, D2E7 was Humira, it eventually became Humira. And the work we did to keep those scientists at, at work, uh, it hadn't been filed yet, um, enabled us to file that NDA about six months earlier. And when you look back now, some 15 years later, it's the biggest selling pharma product in history. And uh, the Canole deal did a number of things. Uh, it made Abbott a truly global company. Um, I was right after we did this, I was at, a, at an Abbott board meeting in Germany and, and one of our board members was a very experienced international guy. He said, you know, you've been an international company, meaning you, you sell products and you do things in different companies. Canole is going to make you a global company because you're going to learn how to participate in those markets as, as they did. And he was right. And it exactly happened. It also enabled um, the spinoff of the hospital products business, which is Hospira, which is not part of Pfizer. It enabled the spinoff of AbbVie, which is, of course is its own entity today. Right. And uh, it, was, it, was a, it was an amazing deal. Uh, it was a tremendous return on the investment. It, it fundamentally changed the company. It, it brought some remarkable people into the organization and, and created all this value for, for shareholders and employees. But it was, it was an interesting assignment from the beginning. <laughs> but, uh, and that was that was all about speed, because if you look at the debt service on seven billion dollars, we borrowed part of that. The, the debt service on what we borrowed, you wouldn't believe. So we were moving with a lot of speed to try to get the synergies up and get the sales in and get the things going we had to do. But had great cooperation from them, and uh, it was a wonderful experience. Wow. Well, you see, folks, the reason why I know that for you, you're none of you may not have any interest in this, but here's why this is important. It's important for you to understand when you are running um, a business, whether it's a smaller business or it's a global healthcare organization, that sometimes you have to pivot. Your your uh, goal 
Goals may say you're going one way, but things happen in the industry and you might have to pivot your business, right? And then as a leader, you may have to uh, bring in other people that can help you with that transition. That's why this is important. From a career perspective, it's helping you understand that not everything that you plan is going to happen the way that you plan it. And you have to be flexible in, in your career. Now, one of the other things, Joe, that you uh, helped the organization get through and, and, and the United States get through, at least the southern part of the United States, was Hurricane Katrina. Yeah. Right. That was one of the, from an Abbott perspective, one of the um, proudest moments in, in a career. Right. And you were our leader during that, during that time period. Uh, what was that like for you? Well, hey, first off, it was satisfying when I listened to your interview with Ron Burke last month that you said that was your proudest moment because that was actually my proudest moment of my career. Um, it was an interesting experience. Uh, you know, it was a, such an epical moment in our country's history. It was one of the worst natural disasters you can think of in terms of how it all came down. Um, and we had to respond relatively quickly. And if, if, if people recall, um, the when the hurricane made landfall, it, it, it turned disastrous overnight, particularly in New Orleans and in certain cities along the Gulf Coast. And people had to be removed, they had to be evacuated because the neighborhoods were gone. Um, and it was a it was just a total mess. And so Houston, where, where you were, uh, ended up being the primary site where people were being brought from New Orleans all the way across the Gulf Coast into, into Houston. And uh, I do remember, as you do, the conference call when we called you up, I think you were with Tim Screen maybe, and uh, we just come from a meeting with with Miles, and he said, "You got to do whatever you got to do." And, and for the audience at the time, we were still trying to build the diagnostic franchise, and we had three large semi tractor trailers called Architours. Uh, Architect was the name of our instrument, and inside the big trailers in the back were working architect instruments that we could take to hospitals and show people what they looked like. It was kind of a cool idea, yeah. uh, but they kind of became like our aircraft carriers for Abbott, and we could deploy power into certain regions, and so. We took those three architectures and we filled them not only with our product and diagnostics, but nutrition products and all kinds of other stuff and deployed them to different places. And one of them, I know two of them at least started and one stayed there, came to you in, in Houston. Yes. And, and for your audience, uh, we identify Cedric as the man on the ground to get the, and Tim Screen to get this done. And uh, what had happened was Harris County in Texas and Houston had um, set up this remarkable evacuation station at the Reliant Complex in Houston, which is the Astrodome Reliant Field and, and the basketball center. And we flew down to check it out and see how it was going to go. Uh, after the call, you don't know this part, after the call with Cedric and, and, and Tim, uh, I had to go back and tell Miles, and he said, well, do you know this guy Cedric? And I said, yeah. And he goes, can you pull this off? And I said, yeah. <laughs> Going like this, I hope he does. So we flew down there. I remember you picked us up and uh, and I, I saw the most remarkable thing I've ever seen in my life, which was what Harris County had provided uh, for 20,000 people to live in the Astrodome, live in the football field, and then to come into the underground parking lot in the basketball arena into a hundred and some bed field hospital that had been set up to triage people. And I remember you met us, you took us around, you knew all the players from your 20 years of relationship building uh, in Harris County. We met all the folks that were running the field hospital, it was an amazing, and they were so grateful to have it because we were there first. I mean, we had this big truck full of stuff. Um, and one of the things that happened was, uh, I remember you took me upstairs and we went out and we looked across the parking lot and there were just legions of uh, buses, school buses and tour coaches coming in from the Gulf Coast. And they would basically wait in line, come to the front of the basketball center, people would get off. Uh, these are folks who lost their homes. They've been in water. 12 hours before. You don't want to be in water in a hurricane. It's a terrible thing. And so they all had to be tested. They didn't have medicine. They didn't have anything, even the clothes on their back. And they were brought in. One of the things they did was a, was a CBC that a red and white blood cell count as a baseline to see what people were doing. And we provided the testing for that in the back of our big trucks, thanks to you. Um, but it was a great moment. It was a great moment for Abbott. I think it was a great moment for watching how one group of people can care for another. The Harris County people never got enough credit for that. But uh, it was a great experience. Uh, it was fun working with you on that. And of course, you came through big time. And uh, it, it was amazing. It was just really an amazing experience. Um, one of the things that we had done in the year prior to that, we started something called the Executive Crisis Management Team. And it, I, I led that team. And it was, a, it was one of my many ancillary duties in addition to running the business. And, uh, and we prepared, we brought in people that trained us for all kinds of things, including natural disasters. And so it was really our first 
experience that UCMT is still in play. I mean, it's, it's act, I know for a fact it's activated today dealing with the pandemic. So, um, but you were a key player in the front part of that, Cedric, and, and you're too humble to talk about it, but people should know the work you did. It was great. Well, thank you. I was definitely um, pleased that that, that um, Avid um, put that trust in, in Tim and myself to make this happen. Um, like I said before, it was one of the proudest moments in my life for you guys to say, whatever they need, it doesn't matter if it's Avid or not. You just let us know what they need and we'll make it happen. Right. Um, that's, that's, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That, that is wonderful. Um, so, you know, leaders come in all different shapes and packages and strengths and, and um, things that they need to work on. What strengths do you feel are important for a successful leader? Well, you know, there's a difference between strengths and, and characteristics. And thing. We could talk about this all day. I think one of them is to be um, authentic. I think people have to know you're real that you're approachable, that you are what you say you are. So to be, I think, authentic and genuine is very important. Um, I think you have to be technically, technically competent to a point. You have to understand the language, be able to know and explain it and, and understand what people are telling you. In order to direct it, you have to be technically competent. I mean, that was certainly the case in the military. You can't imagine military where people aren't <laughs> competent. You can't be that in business either. Um, I think particularly the higher you go, one of the things I learned is you have to be either a very good or a great communicator. You can't be a good communicator. Um, and I think that's particularly true today. Um, you know, business is in front of, you know, my kids have access to their work 24 hours a day. And we do this in the board and the company for the board I sit on. And with technology today, there's no going home at five o'clock. You know, your, your work is with you. It's in the palm of your hand. And there's so much information coming to employees. And unless as the leader, you know how to be a good communicator, you're just going to compete with all that noise. Um, and so being a very, very good or a great communicator, if you don't know how to be one, learn how to be one. There's lots of help uh, to help you be able to do that. Um, you know, I think one of the things that people don't want to do, but you have to do is you have to make tough decisions. Uh, you have to be fair, but you have to make the decision. You know, you, you don't default to a committee. You don't blame your boss. You don't take to your subordinates. You have to make the call. And, and people will know, you know, if, if you're waffling on that. So you have to be able to make uh, uh, tough decisions, but you have to be fair. And I think the one thing I've learned uh, ever since I was in the Army, and this one also kind of we could talk about forever, uh, is you have to pay attention to detail. Um, that comes up over and over again. And you don't have to get in people's desk drawers all the time, but you do have to understand the business and you have to understand detail. That's just, just a matter. There's just a few things. <laughs> well, that's a that's a great list, and I'm going to be using this list tomorrow when I'm talking to a group of entrepreneurs. Um, talk about what things, um, what characteristics that great leaders need to have. One, be authentic. Two, be comp technically competent. Be a great communicator. Be able to make tough decisions. Be fair, and be able to pay attention to the details. That's right. great advice. Absolutely. Um, uh, love that. So I'll be using that tomorrow. I'll be giving you credit for it, but I'll, I'll be using That's okay. it. You can have it for free. <laughs> it's in the air. Okay. It. Um, you know, from a diversity and inclusion standpoint, um, Joe, you were one of the best that, that I've seen at an executive level um, in, in this area. And so why... Why is it that diversity and inclusion so important to you? Well, a um, couple things. I think there, there needs to be some context around diversity and, and, and inclusion, which sometimes can be two different things, oftentimes. It's sure. um, I think the first is to recognize, you know, we live in a very diverse country. We have been diverse for a very long period of time. The problem is we don't embrace diversity all the time. We do here, we don't do there. We do it for some time, then we don't do it in other companies do it, but somebody else doesn't do it. And I think it's a problem and it, it needs to be a way of life. It shouldn't be just something that we do. So I think to recognize we're diverse and, and we all have to live in the same place, we all have to work in the same place, we all have to get along. Uh, we have to recognize it's there. Um, I think it's the right thing to do, which is always you know the best way to start any conversation. Um, it's very good for business. You know, one of the things, as I was thinking about this, I wanna make sure up front that the people are listening don't think that I think diversity is only good because it's a good productivity tool, which it is. 
but we're talking about business. Um, but I, I think there's three things around it for me. One is uh, uh, it's the right thing to do. One is that it's good for business as we're talking about it. And another is it's good for the people that are involved because everybody wants to feel like they have a seat at the table. Um, in terms of business, I mean, I was thinking about as far back as 15 years ago, I was at all employee meetings because uh, we had these all the time, if you remember, trying to change the culture. And I said, uh, back then, you know, the more, more diverse we are, the stronger we are. And there's reasons for that. And that is that um, when we bring people from different places, different backgrounds, different genders, different whatever, everybody's got a different way they were brought up. Um, and everybody has a different way of solving a problem. Everybody has a different way of thinking about growth, different things about for the company. Um, you know, in the course of my career, and in particularly ebb and diagnostics a little bit after, I inherited some businesses that were in distress. And uh, you remember a couple of them. Yeah. And uh, I always knew I was in trouble when I went to those businesses the first time, I went to a conference room, sat around the table, and everybody looked like me. Because I knew that the, the, the tapestry of ideas and, and creativity was not going to be there. And, you know, history is replete with examples of people who surround themselves with people who look like themselves and think like themselves. And it's always a recipe for disaster. Right. And so, you know, if you take you and I, for example, we were raised in different places, not too far apart in time, but in different places. There's a great deal of commonality between you and me in terms of how we were raised in terms of family because uh, I've heard you talk religion, service, and so forth. But there's also differences. We come from a different location, different heritage, different culture. But we each bring something different to the table that's that's important for a leader, for a business person. No, we each solve problems differently. We do go after things differently. And it's that richness that we have to have. And that's why diversity, I think, is very good. And so I used to preach that all the time. And, and there's lots of ways you can practice that. You can you can put people in, the, in who are qualified in positions that somebody didn't let them in before. Um, we started the Finney groups, if you remember, Diagnostic yeah. Women in Action, Black Leadership mm -hmm. Council, Part-Time Network. I was so thrilled to hear Ron Burke talk about there's now a Veterans Network. Yeah. Um, so I think it's important for business. And I think, you know, the faster people embrace that, the better off they're going to be. Um, and that's, like I said, 15 years ago, and here we are talking about it. Um, and I think finally, the third point I had was, was for people themselves. And I think the higher you go in the organization, if you care about uh, the organization and where it's going, you don't want anybody that works for you to feel like they don't have a seat at the table, like their their voice doesn't count, like they don't matter. Um, that's a terrible thing. None of us want to feel that way. Mm -hmm. And if we do think that's the case, then we got to do something about it. And uh, and for that reason too, I think it's it's critically important. So for me, it was always important. I mean, it was important for all those reasons. But uh, I don't need studies to tell me that diversity works in the workplace. It does. It's, it's, you're better for it. <laughs> I saw it with my own eyes. We just need more people to embrace it. Right. Well, we get to the point where we need studies. So one of the things, you know, and, th and there were many things that I remember, but one of the things that sticks with me, it was like you told me yesterday. Um, I, I, I said, Joe, you no, know, corporate HR called me and asked me, how can I find so many diverse candidates and they couldn't find the first candidate? <laughs> and <laughs> you kind of laughed like you said, like you just did there. And you said, look, Cedric, keep doing what you're doing. Bring those candidates forward to us and we'll make sure that uh, they meet all the things that we need and they are a good fit for the organization. We'll make sure that we remove any barriers. But you said this, you said, we are a large global organization. We can find and not find anybody we want to. Yep. And that statement stuck with me uh, way, all these years. It was just it was just a, a dynamic statement. I don't want to talk about corporate HR. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm happy to, I'm happy to talk about the HR that worked for me, but I don't want to with Peggy Taylor. I don't want to talk about corporate. Yeah. HR. <laughs> but it, but it brings up another subject, which is. And this is an unfortunate thing I saw happening then and I see it happen now, which is where leadership defaults to process. Okay. So instead of going to you or to people who are on the ground in the field and saying, you know, we need candidates for this job or another, we try to do it through a process and, and at a high level and it doesn't work. It's the same thing with mentoring. Uh, you know, mentoring has become a lost art. A lot of companies think they want to do mentoring, but instead of encouraging leaders to be mentors, they create a process. Um, I got in a lot of trouble one time uh, as an executive officer at a senior staff meeting when it was suggested that we were going to go to a, 
what I call like a, a dating game for mentors, where instead of it happening naturally, where mentees find mentors or vice versa, uh, the company was going to match them up. <clears throat> and I said, this is not going to work. It's like a one in 10 chance. And of course, I got in a lot of trouble for that. But it didn't work. Of course, it didn't work. It wasn't going to work. But that's the default of leadership to process. And whether it's trying to hire people through a process rather than relying on people who know better, or it's trying to force fit mentors with mentees to say that you did it, uh, it's a problem. And I've seen more and more of that happen. I think it's one of the reasons why we don't have as many mentors today. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, there are a lot of um, uh, young people, millennials, um, and coming up now, the iGeners or Generation Z, uh, and they're trying to land these jobs in major healthcare companies or uh, sales roles, um, what's one or two things you could give them as a word of advice when they are trying to um, get into large global companies? Well, I think there's two things. One is if they're trying to get in, and the second one is if they're in and they're trying to go do something else. Um, Trying to get in is a whole different subject, uh, and, and I think, as you know, uh, and I've seen this with my kids, you know, trying to apply for work anywhere has become an interesting science of, of how you do sure. it. Um, I think, however, once you, uh, people are inside and they want to try something, they take salespeople for an example, and you want to try something different, and, and you're in a sales organization and all you see is your district or your territory. Um, start asking questions of, of people. And uh, one great place to ask, it, it, particularly if you're in field sales, for example, and you're away from the parent company or you're away from headquarters. Um, I ran marketing and sales services. Uh, we did all this stuff to support people in the field. I always really loved it when reps or, or, uh, or DMs would call us and ask us stuff because nobody ever asked us anything. And it's a great way for a young salesperson to understand how the company works because they're dealing with people at headquarters. If you're dealing with someone in a function like that, talk to them, ask them how these things work, ask them what their jobs are like. Um, Because as you know, inevitably in sales, you're going to come back in house at some point and you're going to come into training, you're going to come into marketing, you're going to come into national accounts, you're going to come into something and you don't want to come in cold. And yet all these people are there, you know, and and you're working with them. So take the opportunity to talk to them. Yeah. So really what you're saying is networking is important. It's very important. It's important, you know, whatever we do. Sure. Yeah. And and so, you know, sometimes networking is um, hard. So I know that there's not a best way to network. Right. Um, But what what, what would be what would be what would be some words of advice you would give someone um, when they're networking, either questions they should ask or, or something they should be thinking about talking about in that networking environment? Well, you know, a lot of companies, we can use Avid as an example, have formal networking organizations that promote and help people do this. Um, you can join an affinity group, for example. You're going to meet all kinds of people, typically at levels higher than yourself, who could be very influential to you, even in your particular discipline or, or functional area. Um, there's just so many ways I think you can approach it. Uh, one of the things I was taught early in my career is that volunteering is not a dirty word. Um, that if you volunteer for certain things, you work on the annual fund, you raise money for United Way, you, you are the turkey carver at Thanksgiving. You know, there's a million ways that you can do things within the company uh, to volunteer for stuff that gets you in front of people that you ordinarily you know, probably wouldn't be able to do. So you know, networking can take a lot of routes. I think what's different in networking today versus when I started, there wasn't any. I mean, you had to make your own. And today there's more formal practice, more ways to do that. But, you know, it it falls back on the individual and it, and it brings up something else I want to talk to you about, uh, which is this notion of, of self-advocacy. You know, one of the biggest disappointments I've had since I, I retired from Abbott 13 years ago and then I've been working in private equity is that there is no more mentoring. I mean, people just don't do it. And uh, it's not a leadership expectation on behalf of boards to, to leaders. It's not on leaders to managers. And people just simply don't do it. They do their job, but they don't necessarily mentor. And what's ended up happening is you get employees uh, who feel that, you know, it's every person for themselves. And I spend a lot more time now teaching people how to be self-advocates than worrying about mentoring because there may not be anybody there to mentor them. And so networking goes hand in hand with advocacy. I mean, we've always had a certain amount of self-advocacy we have to do, right? You have to get out, you have to meet people, you have to do things. I think where we're at today in a lot of places is if you want to get ahead, you might have to think 100% of the time you're going to be an advocate for yourself. 
And that's a tough thing to think about, which is if you're lucky enough to have a mentor or if you're in an environment that has them, get one uh, because it's tough. And, uh, you know, my four sons all work. They've been out working for a while. Three are in healthcare, one's in a public accounting firm. And I hear this from them all the time. You know, they have me, but they don't have anybody there. And I've had to teach them how to advocate, how to go in and push their agenda and do the things they want to do. And I do that with a lot of people at lots of different levels, including up to the officer level. So networking, I think, does go hand in hand with this notion of self-advocacy. Yeah. But it, it, it's all around the, the idea that when you join a company, there's not going to be a basket of people there probably to help you. There's a lot of services. There are a lot of things you can take advantage of, but it's going to be up to you to go do it. Um, yeah. so, you know, one, of fun, one of the fun things I used to have, <laughs> I used to look at this every once in a while. Emma had so, and, and it's not an exception, not an exception companies we had so many things for employees most people didn't even know it was there right i didn't know it was there and so if i didn't know it was there chances are you're not going to know it was there right so you got to get out you have to exercise some independence some responsibility you have to advocate for yourself so there are tools there are things there you just got to go find them yeah so let, let me i'll make sure that i'm clear on this when you say self-advocate um there's there's a i guess there's a, a line there where where you start worrying about, well, how do I go and talk about myself to um, maybe not even an executive level person, but someone that's higher up in your organization? How do you start that conversation or approach that conversation? Well, it, it's that and it's a whole lot more. It's, you know, I want a promotion. How am I going to make that happen? I think I should get paid because I'm doing two jobs. Um, you know, I need to go, I want an international assignment. I mean, there's, there's a million variables you can think of that are all typically career related. And it's a function of, of giving people the, a lot of times I come across people, particularly higher in the organization, they've been around for a while. They just need me to kind of give them a push and tell them it's okay. You almost have to give people permission to do it. Um, but I think at all levels, it requires, you just kind of have to understand the objective and that you're, you're going to do it yourself. And you can't be timid. And one of the things I've told my kids, and I just had this conversation with one of them this morning, you don't uh, self-limit something. If you want to go ask for something, ask for everything. Don't think for somebody else. Uh, don't you know, limit yourself before it ever happens. Go in and ask for whatever it is. The worst they can do is say no. But don't you be the one that says no on any or all part of it. Yeah. And that's true for anybody on all kinds of Yes. Well, you, you hit on exactly what I was trying to get at is, um, you know, some people get afraid to ask for the world. Um, yes. You may not get the world, but if you don't ask for it, you're definitely not going to get, get it. Yeah. Um, so don't be afraid to go and ask for what it is you want. That's the key. So, you know, growth has to be intentional. And obviously you're doing a, you've done a lot of things to, to grow yourself and, and to grow the organization. Um, but um, um, why is professional growth and development something that's important to a person's career? You know, if I look back at, at myself, the people that were my peers that I started out with that stayed at the company, who went up in the company, um, the, the people that I worked with later who were my bosses or other people, executive officers, um, all of them took their professional development seriously. Nobody thought that they were in a job by accident. No one thought they were there because they were smarter and better looking than anybody else. They did, they did it as part of an intentional plan. So they had a career plan. They had a way of augmenting. They got an MBA. <clears throat> they got an additional degree. They went, did some other augmentation of training. They did something, you know, they wrote. I mean, I, I, I had colleagues who write about certain things. They present. They, there's lots of different ways you can do self-development or, or professional development. But the successful people that I saw, none of them just did anything more than just keep their nose down and work hard. They did other things to expand themselves, make themselves more valuable. They took lateral assignments. They took assignments in areas that were very uncomfortable to them. You know, they might've been in finance and they went to work in HR. They might've been in HR and they went to work in marketing. Um, the, the notion of, of development is, is critically important. But all I can say is the people I saw, and there were lots of them that were successful, uh, all practice all our parts of what I just told you. So they did they sit around. outside their comfort zone. Yeah. Or, or, I mean, they were active all the time and professionally developing themselves in lots of different ways. 
Awesome. So to my audience tonight, I want you to make sure that you get this point. And I'm going to be talking about this point again later this week. But it's about it's not about just getting a job and then just sitting there and say, I've arrived. Now it's about taking that job very seriously and still growing and developing yourself. And, you know, one of the things Joe said earlier about the self-advocacy, see, when you go to be a self-advocate, one of the things that people are going to ask you, so what do you, what things are you doing? Right. And you have to be ready and prepared to, to talk about that. Yep. Um, so if someone, uh, if, if someone came to you, Joe, to be a mentor, what, um, what, what are you looking for in order to say, yes, I, I'm going to mentor that person? Well, that's an easy one because I've spent a lot of time practicing this over the years. Um, there's two things. One is that they listen, and two is that they generally do as I tell them to do. <clears throat> I don't mean that to sound terribly didactic, but what I mean is if I tell you to do something, I, I don't want you to think about it, and then you know, if you feel like doing it, you'll do it. Um, you know, People do have to listen, and they have to take action. Um, otherwise, I, it's a waste of my time if you take my advice and then don't do anything. And it, after a while, it's kind of easy to find the people who just want to come in and talk to you about stuff and the ones who are really serious about doing something. And so if a person is willing to, and the other way I'll say it is, if a person is willing to listen and invest their time in equal amounts or more, I'm perfectly happy to help. Uh, and you can tell that generally pretty quickly. And it's it's usually a very satisfying relationship when, when that's the case because it's fun to watch people grow. It's fun to watch um, them take advice. It, it, you know, one of the things that's a great learning skill is to take advice from people. You know, there's a lot of young people in particular I, I met growing up who had MBAs from Stanford and other places. They thought they knew everything. Uh, <laughs> they don't. Nobody does. Um, but learning how to take advice from somebody is a critical skill. And uh, and then acting upon that advice, whether it works or not. Uh, most of the time I told people something that did work. But uh, <laughs> if it didn't, then you try again. But, you know, I wanted to always make sure that someone was listening, they were serious about it, uh, and that they were earnest in terms of of doing something. Otherwise, it's not worth anybody's time. And there's plenty of people who are serious about mentoring that need your time. Sure. So I have a very short fuse when it comes to that. <laughs> I don't want to waste time with somebody who just wants to talk to me about something. Sure, absolutely. So I'll, I'll, I'll say like Judge Judy says, I'm not Dr. Phil. If you want someone to talk to, go to Dr. Phil. That's right. I'm not Dr. You don't want me to be Dr. Phil. <laughs> So um, have you ever had to make that tough choice and say, um, yeah, I, I can't mention you anymore? I, I don't know if I had anybody who I was mentoring who I said, I'm not going to do it anymore. I had people I said, you know, you need to try something different. You know, I'm not going to do this. So I, I never had anybody that I unmentored. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. You stuck right. with them. <laughs> <laughs> you stuck with them, and uh, all right, that's awesome. So, <clears throat> from um, you, you know, we talk about mentorship. We talk about diversity and inclusion. Um, but one of the things that around diversity and inclusion, it, it, it ties into community service. And um, what I, I found out in, in the course of you know um, going through this process. Uh, with you to have you on the show is you do a lot of community service. Um, let's talk about some of that, the, the community service that you're doing, because it, it's definitely noteworthy and, and it's important for people to understand um, civic involvement, community service is a way of life. Well, I'll talk about that in a second, but it, it kind of brings up how I got there in the first place. And it comes back to leadership. And we had a discussion earlier about management. Um, we could talk about leadership versus management for five hours and never get close, but um, <clears throat> the way I've always thought about it, it for me, just for me, and, and what I've tried to teach younger people, um, if you have a job, you're a manager, you're a supervisor of people, you have responsibility, you go to work every day, you deliver results, you, you're accountable, you, you meet your goals, and you're looked at as a very good manager, that's wonderful. If you do that for 30 years, God bless you, <clears throat> because that's what you're expected to do. Mm -hmm. I think a further definition of that for leadership is you have a responsibility to do good with the platform that you have. So if you're a manager, if you're a leader, if you're a supervisor, you have a platform. You have a louder voice than most people, and most people have to listen to you. You have resources. You have an ability to get stuff done. You have influence. And you can use that for good. And that, I think, is the difference between a manager 
in a leader is a leader gets all the technical things done, but also steps outside themselves to do other things. And so you have a platform, you've been given a platform and that platform comes with an ability to do things. And there are, and there's lots of ways you can do that. The routes I chose were, um, and I did this my entire working career was to focus on um, representing the company in community service. Uh, it has lots of advantages. It's wonderful team building. It's great for the people you're going out to help in the community. It's wonderful for the company. Of course, we work for a company that encouraged us to do that. Um, it's great leadership training for young managers to organize the day and go help United Way or go help a homeless shelter or whatever you want to go do. Um, and so service is, I think, a very critical part of, of, of that difference of being a leader. Um, in, in my case, after I retired, um, I decided that education was the thing that I, I thought could make the biggest difference. You know, if you think about all the issues in the world, there's only so much any of us can do. But what we can do is, is help education. You can help education, particularly for kids who um, otherwise would have a more difficult time than my kids did, for example, or your kids did. <clears throat> and so that's, it's the best way to success. It's the best way out if you're in a difficult place. And that's where I focus my philanthropy and where I focus my time. Um, and so the three things that, that I've been involved with in the last 15 years, uh, one, we started Christ the King in Chicago. It's, it's what's called a Crystal Ray School. It's part of a network of, I think, over 30 schools now. It's mostly Jesuit run, but they go into the most challenged neighborhoods in America and in the cities. Uh, ones where there's you know poor public schools and there's violence and crime and, and poverty rates. And they build these great Jesuit schools. And the way the, the program works, they have something called corporate work study, where four kids share a job and a company pays the high school for those kids to work five days a week or five days a month. Um, so they pay for about, you know, 60, 70 percent of their tuition and then we fundraise the rest. But they get a great education. They get to work in great places like banks, hospitals in Chicago. They work in the Board of Trade. They work at Mayor Lightfoot's office. They work for the Blackhawks. Uh, they get built in mentors. It's, it's, a, it's a marvelous place. And as you mentioned at the outset, it's on the west side. It's in the Austin neighborhood, uh, which is one of Chicago's biggest neighborhoods, but it's also right now probably the most violent, um, dangerous place to live. There is no public high school. It closed a number of years ago. And so it was a logical location for, for Crystal Ray to come to. And uh, we were involved from the beginning. I was there on the first day when the first 38 kids in the freshman class came in to an old rented Catholic grade school. <clears throat> and then we built a remarkable building a couple of years later, and we now have about 400 kids at the school. And so it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful uh, place in the midst of a place that's, that's pretty difficult. And uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's attracted a lot of attention throughout Chicago, um, but it's very dear to my heart. The other thing I did was um, no good deed goes unturned. So I'd been down here a couple of years and the bishop here in Phoenix, the, the Catholic diocese found out I'd helped build a high school and he said, you should help me here. <laughs> so I ran a feasibility study for a year that looked at a Catholic high school out in the West Valley of Arizona, which is the last undeveloped and fast growing part of the valley. And there was no high school out there for, for uh, no parochial high school. <laughs> and so we built one in a neighborhood that's largely Hispanic, kind of lower middle income, a place where parents generally can't afford to send their kids to a school, but we figured out how to do it. And so <clears throat> St. John Paul II opened several years ago, our first graduating classes next year, so I can't wait. But it's a wonderful uh, place uh, out in the West Valley. That, uh, and prior to that, parents had to drive 30, 35 miles into Phoenix if their kids wanted to go to a Catholic school. Wow. And then the last thing I, <clears throat> I do is I help these young Franciscan missionaries who came here from Pennsylvania five years ago. <clears throat> and they work on the reservation south of Phoenix and they tend to the native people. Um, it's a huge reservation. They're responsible for 12, 12 mission parishes. And uh, Many of the issues that you see on the reservation are the same as you see on the west side of Chicago. Drugs and gangs and violence and alcohol. And <clears throat> it's a tough scene. So, uh, it, so that we have a great school there. Uh, it's an entirely native school. And uh, we spend a lot of time helping with them too. So I, I've just chosen education as the thing I want to do. But I think the larger question here is, or the larger thing that I like to see is, is people using <clears throat> their work experience to help in the community. Yeah. And, and what made you decide, I mean, beside the obvious, but what other reasons made you decide to say education is, for me, that's where my, my passion is going to be and that's where my philanthropy is going to be? I think it's the, the fastest way to make a result. Uh, 
in a child's life, I think it's, or in a community's life. I mean, I look at the impact that Christ the King has played on the West side with 400 kids in there. It's pretty substantial. hundred uh, percent of our kids are, are uh, accepted into college every year. It, it makes a huge difference. And so I think it's the fastest way to help young people in need. Uh, and it's probably the most satisfying. So for us, that was the easy thing to do. Wow. Well, that's a, that's a, just, that's a great value prop just, just on that right there, just the merits of that. Um, that that's awesome. Congratulations on, on that and keep doing that, that wonderful work. You know, Joe, you've had a wonderful and long career, healthy um, in, in terms of success, all the different measures of success uh, career. But we've also, we've all had things that we've uh, failed at or didn't do as well at, as we wanted to. What's one of those things that you said, man, it just, just didn't work out the way I wanted it to work out. And, and what did you learn from it? I had, I had one example. I was in my first job. I was a young inventory controller in the hospital products division. <clears throat> and the inventories I controlled were for IV solutions. And we had this one product we didn't make very often. And I just didn't pay attention to the rubber stopper that went in the top. And I let us run out. It shut down production for two days and we back ordered the product. It wasn't a huge deal. It was more embarrassing than it was in the <laughs> But I learned a lot. I talked before about attention to detail. But I hadn't understood, you know, what would happen if I didn't do that right. I didn't realize 20 people had nothing to do for two days. I didn't realize our customers wouldn't have product for three weeks. Um, so I, it was a great learning experience. I was fortunate to work for a boss who understood. Uh, after he got done kicking me, he explained this to me about how I should do this again, not do this again. Um, <clears throat> But you know, I, I, in the rest of my career, I, I didn't really have anything where I, I could say I cost the company millions of dollars. You know, what I did have were, uh, and I was pretty good at hiring people, but I had a few that didn't work out that I would tell you were failures uh, on my part for not seeing it through enough, not betting enough, <clears throat> and that can also cost the company money if you get somebody in there at a senior level. I didn't have a lot of them, but I had a couple, uh, and you have to learn from those. You have to understand how did somebody slip through that net. Uh, when typically you, you have a pretty good track record of, of doing it. So I didn't have a lot of process failures. I had some people failures, uh, but you have to learn from them. I mean, sure. I from them. but you know, we were fortunate to work for a company where by and large, if we made mistakes, we were allowed to, and we were told, you know, you can't do it more than once, but yeah, right. uh, we, were, we were taught what not to do again. If that was the right. Case. Yeah. If you do that multiple times, you, you have probably a different conversation, right? Right. <laughs> A very different conversation. <laughs> so, <clears throat> you know, this is a little bit off, off topic, but you may not even remember this. I just remember it. Um, uh -oh. We, we were <laughs> so we were at a national sales meeting, and I don't remember where we were, but we were at a national sales meeting, and um, your your first wife was was there, and I didn't know who she was, and we were just everybody was just laughing and talking. And then we got started talking about our lifestyles and where we we're from and all this type of stuff. And she and I got into this long conversation. Now, again, I didn't know who she was. And, and so, and we kind of like disagreed on, on certain things. It was still a good conversation, but all the other avid people <laughs> knew who she was. <laughs> and you were like way on the other side, not even paying attention. Like, I never forget Kyle McGiven, was like Cedric, uh, quiet, be quiet. Be quiet. <laughs> and you know, I was just going on and going, we were just going back and forth. And afterwards, Kyle said, Cedric, do you know whose wife that was? I said, no, who is that? He goes, that's Joe Nimmers. I was like, oh my God, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> she never told me anything. <laughs> it was just interesting. Boy, they, you, if you could have seen them, uh, reacting. Oh, I'm sure they're having a great time. <laughs> but you know, I, I used to bring, uh, you, you're talking about my late wife, Kathy. I used to bring her along to stuff and she was very involved in the things I did in my career. Um, but you know, she would never tell me if she had conversations with you. guys. And I never told her what I was, she, she'd always tell people, I don't know what he's doing until I read it in the newspaper. Because, you know, when you're a head of a public company, you, you know, she just went like this all the time until it happened. But, no, she never told me that she had that conversation with me. Yeah, it was it, it was funny. Um, so th this question is, is maybe a little difficult, but if you had to pick two things that someone should do in their career 
in order to move to an executive level position, what, what would that be? Uh, pray. <laughs> And be careful what you wish for. <laughs> you know, I, I think uh, it's kind of, everybody rises to a level, or to an executive level, a different way, like I described before. Uh, mine was being in the right place at the right time and having a certain skill set that was needed by the company. Um, it, it just kind of depends, I think. I, you know, I, I think the common things that, that you want that are successful for you in your first job will be successful for you in your last job. Uh, if you work hard, if you're honest, if you're good with people, uh, if you perform, you achieve, you produce results, you do all the things you're supposed to do. Whatever you learn how to do in that first job, if you're still doing them by the last job, you might be an executive. So I don't think there's any secret sauce to it other than to pay attention and, and uh, take opportunities as they come. Um, you know, going back to laterals, there's sort of a corollary to laterals, which is, we talked about briefly, which is doing things <clears throat> or doing something that's not what you were trained to do or that you thought you were going to do or that might have been way out of your comfort zone or that other people told you you know you know don't go to work in quality don't go to work in manufacturing what's wrong with you <clears throat> that could be some of the dumbest advice you could get um, and you have to follow your heart um, you know one of the things i've learned over time is that most people the vast majority of the time their instinct is correct and don't let somebody else talk you out of your instinct because it's almost always right so uh, I would say if you're going to try to be an executive someday, like I said, be careful what you want to do. Uh, but just work hard, do all the things in the first job. You'll be doing the same things in your last job. Awesome. Well, that's, that's good advice. So here's what I, I took from that post. He said work hard. So that means, and, and work hard doesn't just mean beat yourself, beat yourself, beat yourself. He's also talking about working smart, um, being honest, and then producing results. Results take care of a whole lot of things. So just remember that. Um, there's, 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 there's a corollary to this, Cedric, if I can sure, yeah, absolutely. close with that. Um, when I was in the Army Reserve, I worked for a, a general officer. He was a great guy. He was a very faithful man. And to this day, he still talks about this. But he, he said there are three things you have to do in your career at all times. You have to be physically fit, you have to be mentally fit, and you have to be spiritually fit. Um, no, he didn't mean you have to run Iron Man or anything. He didn't, he didn't mean, you know, but he, what he said was you have to be ready for things, you know. So the higher you go in the organization, you have more stress, you better be physically and mentally fit. Um, you better be spiritually fit, however you choose to do that. But, and he said you have to do all three. You can't do two and miss one. You can't do one and miss two. You have to do all three. So you have to be physically fit to the task. You have to be mentally fit for it. And in, in your mind, however you do that, you have to be spiritually balanced. Um, because the higher you go, the tougher it gets. And there's, you know, sometimes those are the only things you have to rely upon. And he was right, you know, and everybody's different how you approach that. Um, <clears throat> but I think it was good advice. I've never forgotten it. He still preaches it, but it's good stuff. Well, that's awesome. I like that. Mentally fit, physically fit, spiritually fit folks wow i have so many good um lessons for uh later this week so i'm gonna ask you one last question here so you, you know you're, you're retired or you're semi-retired um and uh but so what's next for you well you know when i retired from abbott <clears throat> for the first six months people will call me and say how are you you know, like I was dying or something. And I say, hey, I retired from Abbott. I didn't retire from life. I mean, I'm still here. Um, so, you know, I, I stay really busy. Uh, just like you, you're an Abbott retiree. Look at you. Um, almost every Abbott retiree I know, including my wife, we, we have more things to do than we have time. So we have lots of stuff. Like you said, we have nine kids. We got all kinds of things going on. Um, Kathy's going back to school, too. Uh, she's in, she, you know, she went back to school and got her nursing degree after she retired. 30 years of that and she's going back looking at um a master's degree to help combine uh, spiritual healing with physical healing so, become so hold on stop right there before you go for a start folks I, I i want you to he slid right by that i want you to understand this his wife spent years with how many years was she with Abbott? 30 30 year career she's retired and she's still growing she went back to school and got an, an, another degree, a nursing degree, and now she's going to go get another degree. See, folks, we always tell you you have to be intentional about growth. 
that's intentionality right there. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I can't talk to you, Cedric. <laughs> <laughs> I never could. I'm not going to try now. <laughs> well, hey, Joe, I want to tell you from the top of my heart, from the bottom of my heart, I totally appreciate you spending time with Talk Leadership, Cedric, and joining me today. Um, uh, this was just awesome experience for me. Hopefully it was good for you as well. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. So guys, thank you for tuning in tonight. There's a lot of avid uh, people that were in there. Ron Burke said, hold and pull relieve. You know, that was your famous line. Right. <laughs> he said, Ron, you're relieved. <laughs> He's relieved. So are you. <laughs> uh, we have Glenda Cheatham on. Mark Smith dropped in. Stuart Everstein dropped in. Uh, Sheila Waters dropped in. Um, a young lady who you don't know yet, which I'm going to introduce you to her. She's a sales rep. Um, I hired her into Abbott. She lives in Phoenix. Her name is Bettina uh, Ortiz. And uh, Ken, your, your good friend Ken Thornton dropped in. Uh, obviously, Ron Burke, uh, Marlene Waters uh, dropped in, and some that in that didn't comment. So uh, a lot of Abbott people here tonight to say hello to you. Um, so again, thank you very much for, for coming on the show tonight. Hey guys, tomorrow night, tune in at 5.30 Central Time. We will have Miss Inga Scott Collins on the show. You don't want to miss Miss Inga. Well, she is an awesome young lady doing some wonderful things. You, you say millennials are not doing anything. She's a millennial that's making moves. Then tomorrow night at 6.30, we will be on the Empowered Living Network with the Black Entrepreneurs Institute. Then don't finish there. Come right back here to Facebook at 7.30. My daughter will be on Talk with TK with her Mindset 180 Academy. And then Monday night, folks, for all you Louisiana people and everybody that wants to hear from a school district superintendent, Mr. Carl Brookhouse will be our guest next Monday night. So tune in. And Thursday this week, we'll finish up at 4 p.m. Central on the IBGR.network. Uh, with my weekly radio show. Remember, folks, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Don't be on the menu. Thank you for tuning in tonight. See you next week.